Caddis Max. So here this time with a review of an uh, old but very common, these show up all the time, used Mikita 1900B hand power planer. A wood plane is one of those blocks, I actually don't have one handy, where you push and it brings up curls of wood and is used to flatten wood. Very precisely, it's actually more precise than a belt sander for just doing flattening operations. It also allows you to remove precise amounts of wood, in this case up to 64 of an inch. Now this will do up to 3 64 of an inch uh, maximum depth of cut. It is only 4 amps, it's at 15,000 RPM. So you would want to go pretty slow and it just doesn't take a particularly deep cut. This is actually a pretty nice example. I picked this up for 15 bucks, and in a second we'll see why it was 15 bucks instead of something more reasonable like 30. It really is in pretty decent condition. You have your adjustment knob. We have a lock here. There is actually a edge guide. This is a modern enough where it has a V groove, so if you want to balance it on the edge of a piece of material and take bevel the corner, you can do that. These are actually used by carpenters pretty often because they are cutting large lum uh, pieces of lumber where they have to make one cut on one side and one cut on the other side just because they don't have a big enough saw. And often, even if they're very good, there's like a little bit of a lip that's left and then they'll just use one of these to go along and flatten it out. I do like these older models with the metal side plate. It seems a lot of the newer ones are all just plastic. With Makita, how we know about them is they've been dating their tools for a long time, which is really nice. So we can see this one was made in the ninth month of 1990. So, wow, 29-year-old unit, and it does run good. I am going to replace the power cord. It did get a little bit chewed up, and I'm not going to try to electrical tape that. Uh, even the strain relief is pretty good condition. Now, a couple things is the Makita does this where the belt is real close to the bottom and is open. And I never particularly like that because it does allow a chance for particles to get in there. But it always seems to hold up well enough. But we'll pop that side cover and take a look. Take a look at the brushes. Now we can see why I got it for 15 bucks. And this often happens. Somebody thinks that they can level out an area on their deck or something with one of these. And they run over deck screws and just really hammer it. Those screws really even got into the metal support plate. But I'm sure it'll be okay. I do have a set of blades for it. And we, what is nice about the exposed belt is it makes it easier to roll over. This does have two cutters and they are just uh, horizontally across. They're not hel helical in any fashion or angled. And how these work by the depth adjustment is when you adjust this screw, it raises and lowers this front plate. So at zero, it's right at the same level with the edge of the blades and doesn't remove anything. And as you adjust this knob, it moves this plate upwards, exposing a bit of the blade. So when you come across, it hits the blade and removes this the exact amount. And then the back uh, shoe just supports it as you glide along. This being an older unit, it does not have a vacuum port. It does have this uh, kind of a shroud here to deflect the chips. And of course a bearing on the opposite side to support both sides of the roller. The big deal about the metal play is it supports the high tension area where uh, the belt is between the motor and then the, the input for the cutting head. This has a screw in it to remove this. That way you can access this back brush here and it does have easy to replace brushes. A hallmark of any halfway decent tool and the reason we're going through this effort is I did have a DeWalt but I ended up selling it a long time ago and so I found this and it ended up having not just a tool with that damage which I can deal with but the whole case really hard to see but it actually these came with a spare screw I'll have to figure out exactly what this block is for I don't recognize it offhand but obviously there's a little area for it it comes with a little T-handle wrench which is for changing the blades, working on those little 9mm bolts. This right here is the edge guide. This is something you would put in through this port here, and it's exactly what it says it is. It's just something that allows the hand planer to go right along the edge, say if you're trying to uh, trim, use these to trim down a door that's sticking. This is exactly what you would use one of these type of uh, accessories for, and they're kind of hard to find, and the Makita's around. Uh, so it's nice to see that. And since they vibrate quite a bit, this does come with the screwdriver, and this is what's kind of neat. 
is this is a it's funny that it says 10,000 V on it I don't know if that's a voltage rating or something it just seems a little bit weird but we have a Makita branded red handle Phillips head screwdriver it is not the best screwdriver I have ever seen but it's in decent condition and to tell you what uh, Makita branded acetate handle screwdrivers are definitely not common there are Makita screwdrivers um, but that's actually kind of a neat little collector's item so this video was a service and review so I'm just going over and then uh, I'm going to do some pausing you know some cuts to uh, try to make it go a little faster but we'll inspect the belt and we'll replace the power cord I'll check on the brushes deal with the cutters and then uh, I have a big block of wood and we'll see how well it actually works when you're inspecting these types of tools and the belts that they use you just want to make sure that the belts the little V's these are a multi groove belt to give them more traction or more friction so that they work they get excuse me so they don't slip as easily dust can build up in these it's not too bad here but if you're looking at these belts and there is dust in them just take a nail or a pick or something and just run the belt along and scrape out any of the particles we can see that Makita uses steel pulleys on both sides which is really nice and they don't appear to be jammed up with too much stuff usually it's belt sanders I've seen belt sanders where it's just tons of buildup these types of tools don't they develop fine wood dust but not like a belt sander which exclusively makes dust this is a combination of various sized wood chips some of them big some of them tiny when you get a tool like this it's always a good idea especially you know a, I mean not a new one but a definitely a used one is to go along and just take a screwdriver and make sure all the fasteners feel nice and tight you don't have to wrench down on them but you want to make sure that maybe one of these screws hasn't started to come loose on the bottom plate. And this is with any tools. Just quickly give a, you know, just a quick uh, turn on all the screws just to make sure that none of them feel like they are loose. Now since brushes wear quite evenly, really all we have to do is remove one of them. You could remove both of them. The key to these brush holders that take slotted screwdrivers is they're made out of an electrically and heat resistant plastic and they tend to be very brittle and want to chip out so the idea is that you want to get a screwdriver that's literally just as big as can physically fit in that slot to get as much surface area we can see one thing that I really like about Makita's is this uh, brush cover is unidirectional you can use it on either side so if you end up chipping out one side but are able to get it unscrewed you can just flip it over and you'll have a new slot to use so pretty wise for maintenance there when you pull out brushes, you want to make sure you pay attention to which way is up or down, their orientation. And that's because the motor, like in a tool like this, in an electric drill will spin backwards, but in this tool, it only ever turns one direction, and so the brush ends up wearing in that direction. And if you flip it around when you're putting it back in, you'll get some funny sounds from the motor for a little while, as the sharp edge, trailing edge, is now the new leading edge and kind of grinds away. So you just want to be careful or pay attention to that. And we can see that it was this way. And we can see that there's actually plenty of brush left in this. So we're just fine. It's a captured brush, so it has a little wire just to help with additional uh, conductivity, additional current getting through. And many times you can tell how hard a tool has been used. If you just pull out the brushes, if the copper wire is discolored in the middle, it's ob then that's evidence that it's been run really hot. Hot enough for the copper to oxidize. And uh, you should take that into consideration. But it's one of the easiest things you can do. Just pop out a brush and say, oh gosh, look, it's all purple and different colors. It's definitely been overheated. I probably should buy a different one unless it's a good deal. Okay, I am going to go ahead and swap out the power cord on this just because this one's kind of chewed up. And it's definitely older, and given the condition of this tool, I do want to replace it. And it's kind of funny, you know, how now this, I, you know, how does this end up somewhere? Somebody has this thing, bought it 30 years ago, loved the great Makita tool. And even if they're like, say, in their 40s, 30 years ago, that mean that they're, if they were 40, they'd be 70 or they'd be 69 years old use it, end up doing what they did to this one, which is run it into a bunch of nails and screws, 
and then have it sit on the shelf for another 10 to 20 years before they finally say, oh, I'm finally not going to fix that and I'm not going to get around to it. And they uh, end up, you know, selling it or donating it. But it's an example of one of those things where people are just going to hold on to something because sure enough, they're, they're going to fix it, but they never do. And I'm somebody who's notorious for doing that, and I periodically go and just get rid of a bunch of different stuff just to uh, prevent it from getting too out of control. And then really have things that are useful, lots of supplies, things like sandpaper and that kind of thing. You can only really need so many power cords on hand. Five or ten power cords will really handle most of the service for used tools, and you'll just pick them up as you need to. I'm saying this because I was somebody who had like 30 pounds of power cords, and I was like, what the heck am I doing? Anyway, this cover, four screws, slides off. This is glass reinforced nylon. This is classic Makita. We can see that almost looks like there's silver fleck. That's not painted. That's uh, nylon with, you know, 30% fiberglass in it. And it's the fiberglass that causes that sheen. And also lets you know it's a quality product. So we can see on the power switch that, uh, at least on these older ones, they're actually using little terminals that are crimped and screwed into the power switch. So that's a real solid measure right there. We can even see under the strain relief that they put another layer of plastic, just a, which is surprising. They also have a layer of plastic, even though it's a plastic housing, that's just extra resistance to chafing. It's actually really nice to see. It's something even Makita doesn't do these days. It's because it's an ac extra expense that never really proved to be necessary. Uh, but it's nice to see it in these older tools. Anyway, let me get this power cord out of here and uh, dig up the necessary tools to prep the new wire. Okay, so the first thing I like to do is make sure I put on the strain relief the correct direction and put it on first. I'm always doing wires and then realize I forgot the strain relief, so I'll we'll put that on. And I'll put on this uh, extra little insulation that they have just because. Uh, if they had it before, why not do it again? And I'm using the same gauge wire here, and we'll just put that right where uh, the old thing was. This is a pretty decent wire. It's a nice rubber cold coated 90 degrees Celsius rated wire. This is a vintage tool. I think I'll use my vintage wire strippers here, and we'll just go ahead and pop these. Where is? There we go. I tend to like to use just a slightly larger size die uh, just because they tend to work pretty well and it really ensures that you're not going to have any issues accidentally cutting into the wire which can happen but sometimes the insulation is pretty tough or it's a thinner insulation and it doesn't allow you to do that. There we go you kind of have to be a little quick with the motion on these and then we'll just put on our little connectors it's always kind of tough because you got to find these little ring terminals that have re are really small and have a really narrow bulb so that they'll fit into the slots of these switches. It's probably one of the biggest hassles that you run into. It's always a little bit of a dance getting these together because you got to twist these on here. Make sure the wire's not too far in here. And then get them all set up in the crimpers and make sure I got the right direction in the crimper. It's always exciting when you try to crimp and you have the little terminal in backwards. Make sure I get that forward far enough in here and get it turned. This is always a little bit delicate. The nice thing about ratcheting ones is that you can get them into the first ratchet notch or just ratchet them where they're just barely gripping the terminal so you can get it aligned just perfectly and something I really like to do. Of course I got the wire to fall out which is always one of the cruxes of working with these terminals. Once you finally have it dealt with when you crimp you always want to make sure you crimp with plenty of force. A lot of people just don't put enough force in and that's what's nice about ratcheting crimpers is because they force you to go through a full motion and really get these terminals really seated nicely and of course a ratcheting one gives you these this nice effect where it's a, a just a nice crimp there and then it squishes the plastics around the insulation for a type of strain relief as a matter of fact we can see it's exactly the same type of crimper that was used at the factory when this was originally made 
After you crimp your terminals, you do want to give them just a nice pull just to make sure that they are solidly on there. So just going to reattach this to the switch, double check that this works, and we'll replace the blades. One item of note is with the ring terminals, you want to make sure that it's the flat side that you're screwing down and the screw goes through the raised side. So many times I've seen these installed upside down and they just don't work as well. You'll think it's tight, but it's actually just kind of binding up on a bent terminal. And in case anybody's wondering, yeah, this is something Makita, it was just a standard. They'd use fine machine thread screws in directly in the plastic. You know, the reason that's a problem is because fine thread screws uh, don't the threads are not cut quite as deeply so they don't work as well in plastic but what Makita does is just make extra deep holes for them to thread into and I always thought that was interesting we'll give it a quick bump here to make sure my work is okay make sure your hands are out of the way works just fine sounds like there may be a little bit of a rough bearing but that'll be a future video because you really have to take apart the whole thing uh, to do the bearings Plus, you got to order them and everything else. So let's deal with the blades on this unit. That's probably the biggest issue that this thing has. How these work is they have three different bolts here. It sits on what is like a washer plate, which is then compressing a steel plate, which is actually holding little carbide inserts. So we'll see how beat up this is. Usually you can get them in there, and then we'll do a test to see if... Uh, sometimes it's just so warped that the blades will crack when you're using the tool again. Always make sure that the tool is unplugged obviously when you're working on it. But many times you can recover. But this type of damage is pretty severe. And many times, like in this case, the bolts are surprisingly tight. So I'm using a little breaker bar here. It does have a, like a little T-handle wrench indicating how much t you don't really need a tremendous amount of torque to hold them in. But people usually just torque the beans out of these little bolts. And just like so, we've got those, I'm going to get them just a touch looser. You don't want to pull them all the way out. And it is nice that the Mikita does include a spare bolt in case you lose one. Actually, I do need to pull these all the way out because we have uh, a shattered, yeah, it is a broken, I think it is. Yeah, it's broken into multiple pieces. So I got to make sure all the pieces are out of there. I'll try to fidget all this out like that. We can see some crud that has built up. We can also see that there's a secondary uh, retention plate. What this is, is this is a pivoting adjustment. You have these two screws and these, it's basically, this is an angled plate. It's in a slot. These two screws kind of go through that plate through this plate which has a little bit of uh, ability to move up and down and then into the aluminum casting or excuse me the billet piece of aluminum that allows you to adjust the pitch of the blade so if it isn't going straight across you can actually tilt the blade one way or the other or actually push it out or push it in that's how you calibrate this to the zero mark on the handle Many times people have issues with the accuracy of the zero mark. They're like, it, it's not, it's cutting when it's at zero or it's not doing what it's supposed to. Uh, oftentimes you just need to adjust the blade height. I did want to point out that it, when you're adjusting the blades, it's not a lot of torque. These screws act, actually don't go in that far. And, I, and on this Makita, and I was incorrect, that's just attaching this this plate that moves back and forth is angled plate which is captured those screws actually aren't retaining it to uh, the actual cutting head as we can see even how severe that was there's only a couple little nicks actually on the cutting head itself fortunately when this type of incident does occur they do attempt to design them to where most of the damage will be contained in easily replaceable parts but this thing's so old you can't get these parts anymore this is what a carbide blade actually looks like. It's just a thin little blade, and the idea is it's captured with this groove, and when one edge wears, you can actually pull it out and flip it around. And it's supported between that sandwich, and that little groove just sits on these two little bumps that are inside this piece and kind of rides against those tabs, just like so. I have to take it just a moment, though, because we can see that the damage, like right there, 
it's actually pushed past that metal surface so it's not going to actually clamp properly and I'm just going to have to uh, take a moment and file that down. Of course it's only now I realize that this whole piece is designed to be pulled in and out uh, without having to mess with the precision adjustment. Anyway on this front side here it's not really such a big deal I probably should knock off that burr right there. All we have could do on this side was as you can see just try to do my best to knock off any of the portions that were raised below the surface so that it gets even pressure across the entire cutting bit. So it's a little bit harder with these spacers or these adjusters when they're beat up. One trick you can do is you can just pull them both out and then just use some calipers over the edges. That way you can uh, if you loosen one up like I did, but you have another one at the factory location, you can just measure across there and then put the first one back into the same position. That will allow you to make sure that it's nice and even. And when you're adjusting these, a pair of calipers makes it a lot easier. Because you can tighten these screws just enough to where it has like a little bit of tension. And you can adjust it and then lock it down and it can be very precise. We can see just how hitting nails just causes the carbide just to completely shatter. These things really, you got to really make sure you're not hitting metal with these things. Too many times people are using these power planers and hitting nails. I've seen so many of them. Probably half the ones I've ever seen used anywhere, uh, it's this situation where they've hit something with them and I don't know how you know, I can see some situations, but it's just surprising how many of these tools are ruined. It's probably one of the reasons they're not super popular. They're kind of expensive, around $100 for a basic one, $150 or more for a better quality one. And it's so easy just to cause this kind of damage just in a split second, just the end of a nail you didn't see, and boom. Or a screw, and the whole thing explodes, and you got a bunch of work ahead of you. Okay, we're ready to get these blades back in. One thing I do want to mention is that for, uh, I had a, a DeWalt that I reviewed a long time ago that I since sold. But these blades tend to be 3 and 1 quarter inches wide. And some of the older units actually were made for 3 inch blades and that creates a problem. The blade's a little bit too wide. All the other dimensions are the same. They're totally compatible. But I noticed once where the blade was obviously a little bit too long. These are the correct width for the Makita so it'll work fine. But if that happens, Harbor Freight sells little Dremel diamond cutoff wheels. Since this is pure carbide, you're gonna, it's going to be almost impossible with any kind of an abrasive wheel. But with a little diamond wheel in a Dremel, it's surprising. You can just cut one of these right off. So the idea here is that once you get the assembly on there, you leave just a little bit of space for the screws. And then you slide in the blade. Make sure that it appears that it's parallel. This has a bunch of damage, obviously, so it doesn't look as parallel as it really is. And then one important aspect is to really make sure that the blade is well-centered, so you're not going to have any issues hitting on either side. And in this case, we can see that it's going to spin around just fine. We have just enough clearance. This blade may be just a little bit wide for this planer, and uh, I may end up cutting it down. But for this test, we'll just leave it right where it's at. It's really important that these are properly fastened. A lot of people do get too much torque on them, but you do want to have a fair amount. You start by the, using the middle one, get it kind of finger tight, and then you do the end ones. And you just keep repeating until you feel it really cinch down and lock down. It is important because these things will want to come loose. And if one of these bolts comes loose when this thing's running at 15,000 RPM, it will destroy these plates and throw metal pieces at pretty high velocity so always emphasize safety in that respect probably do a video in the future but a quick tip for adjusting the blades is you just take something with a pretty decent straight edge it's a little actually easier on the Makita because the belts exposed so it's really easy to spin the cutter head but if you have the handle here at zero there's the arrow then you just take on on both sides you just put something on there and just see if the blade wants to catch something. So we know that we're good right here. This also allows you to look down and see how even it really is. It's actually pretty good. How about on this side? If I can get this in frame, it's a little awkward. Same deal here. It's actually pretty good. 
this is really a surprising result considering I'm using those old parts. I was able to grind off enough for them to seat down properly. And so this may be a little bit out of adjustment. I mean, absolutely perfect is when you put something like this piece of aluminum across. It would just barely leave a touch of a mark. That's when you know it's absolutely perfect. And then you can really trust this dial. And the reason it's a big issue is because you're removing such small amounts, but these things do work quickly. Let's give it a quick bump, and then I'll test it on a piece of wood. Here we go. We're just making sure it works. And then, uh, well, we know it works, but everything's going to be ready to go. Now, you do need to be careful. It's pretty easy to set one of these down while it's still running. This is an older Makita, newer ones. Uh, like that old De that DeWalt that I had has like a little drop finger. So when you set it down, the little finger will dangle off and it'll sit on it, keep it above a surface. But you always need to be real careful of that. Make sure that they come to a complete stop or you really just need to get into the habit of setting it on its side. Excuse me, totally out of frame. I'm really bad about that in this video. But you even have to be careful about that because this thing actually really wants to flop. It's a, you know, designed to be a very bottom heavy tool. We can see that the balance is very good. It does not want to tilt left or right. And I was just noticing that on this Makita. Really excellent balance. I'm just behind the trigger and it's almost perfectly balanced this way. So on the trigger, the whole center of the way of the tool is all right there. It's really pretty good attention to detail. Let's see how this thing runs. I already did a uh, test cut to make sure it wouldn't blow up on me, but when you make passes with one of these tools, you don't want to go over the same area twice. You're going to want to go across the whole surface, and you do want to keep it pretty level. You do want to start off from the edge, and then ease in and go across pretty evenly, not too fast. On a more powerful unit, you can go a little quicker, take deep, deeper cuts. This is at 1 32nd of an inch. And you'll just make successive passes across and we can see how much this is a real rough cut so we can see just how fast this is going across here Sorry, that was pretty loud. I'll try to remember to turn that down in the video. As we can see, just one pass at a 32nd of an inch makes a big difference. You also want to rip or go along with the grain rather than cross cut as much as possible. They work a lot better when you're going with the grain. I'm going to do another couple quick passes uh, from where I started just to show how from that pretty heavy rough cut, just two passes. And I'm not going to complete the second pass. So now we can see what we're doing here. Just two passes from that heavy rough cut. This could probably use a third pass to really get it nice, but those planers just really are excellent for producing a nice, flat, smooth surface. The first surface of this is the only thing you might want to do is surf or is finish sand it. Works so much faster than a belt sander when you can use it just for these purposes, as well as the ability to be able to cut pretty relatively precise bevels. If you have a door that's or a door jam that's crooked and you need to remove a, it's touching on the top and the bottom, you would just start off and you might hit from the edge and you would take a few passes and that's how you get a uh, angled surface. 
another nice aspect of the power planes is they have pretty square edges. One of the biggest problems with belt sanders is when you come up to the edge, really trying to keep the belt sander under control and really trying to keep it level so you don't get any rounding where the power plane, because of its wide shoe, you're just pressing down and as it comes across, it's still laying flat on the back. So anyway, I'm going to end this long video here. This is uh, an old tool picked up and figured it would be pretty nice. I had a few people comment who liked the videos where you kind of get more into service and repairing and that kind of stuff. So I thought that was perfect for this. For anybody who finds a power plane, that would be basically the kind of procedure, especially the nail impact procedure. That's about the best thing you can do is, you know, take a file or a dremel and fix the, uh, the damage and to get it as flat a surface as possible for to re-grip the blade and, and it will work. And this thing I like, it's uh, you know a, a 1990 uh, Japanese, an old uh, Mikita Electric Works made in Japan hand planer. And probably one of the most popular ones of the old hand power planes. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Until next time, Gaddis Maximus out.